I'm Corey Johnson. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Hewlett Packard revenue takes a 10% dive. The stock taking a dive with it. We're going to break down the mixed bag of first quarter earnings results. Plus, John Chambers' big bet on voice. Cisco's executive chairman explains why he's sinking his money into Pindrop, the phone fraud fighting startup. And Square hits its stride after a record fourth quarter. Our interview on the road ahead with the company's CFO, Sarah Fryer. But first, our lead, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, reporting a 10% fall in revenue in its first quarter earnings report, fiscal first quarter. Of course, shares in extended trading now down about 6%. The company had revenue at $11.4 billion and a profit of $267 million. But that's unchanged from a year ago, despite loads of acquisitions. As if that weren't bad enough. The company offered a weak profit forecast for the current quarter and the current fiscal year. Keith Raboy joins us right now, partner at Coastal Ventures and my guest host for the hour. Glad to see you, man. Uh, as well as uh, uh, Crawford Del Pret in Massachusetts, chief research officer and executive VP at IDC. Uh, as it relates to this quarter, Crawford, what happened? Yeah, so what you're seeing, Corey, is that this is a company that has really cut and cut and cut uh, and is, you know, extremely uh, lean in terms of, you know, overall expenses. So that as the as the top line goes, you know, you're going to see that um, right away on the bottom line. Um, now, the company experienced a few different dynamics in the quarter. Um, they still are suffering from the impact of, of FX, of, of, of currency fluctuations. Commodity prices took a spike. So they saw, uh, in some cases, as much as a 50% increase in memory prices. So that, you know, flows through um, to the bottom line. And then don't forget that, you know, you talked about a couple of acquisitions, you know, I would say those probably aren't that impactful yet, um, except for a Well, obviously they're not impactful because the profits well, are not moving at all. Well, yeah, fair point, fair point. Uh, but what they also did is they named a new head of services, a new uh, head of sales, um, and a new head of the channel. And I think that, you know, from an execution standpoint, they had some issues. And you're seeing that right away in the results. And again, like I, like I say, where the top line goes, um, you know, right away, you, you know, you, 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 there's really no place for the company to maneuver when they have a shortfall on the top line, which is what they had. Uh, the number that uh, I want to bring up a chart of the um, uh, free cash flow numbers. Uh, this is a number I look at for a lot of companies, and I think it's important for, for HP. But uh, I'll give him a break on this one. Uh, it was a horrendous free cash flow number, a $2.4 billion a decline in free cash flow. But I think part of that was related. There was a footnote, uh, and I don't want to read too much into that, because there was a footnote saying that they were essentially moving some pension liabilities to the joint venture that they created in the quarter. Yeah, again, there's 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 going to be you know a, a significant amount of of puts and takes in terms of what what the history of of the company has been. But you know, make no mistake, it was a it, it was you know it was a weak free cash flow quarter, and you know that co comes out in the results straight up. Uh, I don't want to see that, uh, Keith Boy. Let me ask you about this from a, a big, bigger picture level. I won't make you do a, a model the company here on the fly. <laughs> But, but I, think it's, I think it's really interesting to see this change in computing when we see the results from, I don't care if it's like Oracle Sun Division, IBM, Dell, we don't see results from anymore, I, uh, 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 even Cisco, um, because you see we're going from a world of selling servers and computer equipment to every company to selling it to three, Amazon, Microsoft, and, and you know, maybe Rackspace or Google. Sure, and I think that there's a big macro trend, like all the company brands that we grew up with or I grew up with, IBM, um, Oracle, let's say HP, are going to be less relevant. I mean, I think you know you see it in IBM's numbers. It's probably highly correlated with HP's numbers, and then none of those companies know how to get you know sort of a, on the new wave. And it's not clear that they have a new wave in them, and they may just be minting, you know, mining the cash flow that's left in these companies for the next five years. But there, there's not a core growth strategy there unless they get lucky and acquire something that has real momentum, real fuel, real rocket power behind it. And those are hard acquisitions to do because those companies know that they have real momentum. And the market knows it. Yeah, the market. I mean, like the founders of those companies don't want to sell those companies. So fundamentally. They have a structural problem. The world has changed, and when you have three buyers, let's say, this, the buyers have power. They have pricing power. Um, so at the end of the day, the like, sellers have pricing power. Uh, uh, well, depending uh, on who the buyers. So sellers. sellers of startup companies, the buyers of, of what of, of Amazon, yeah. of, of the big cloud providers. When there's only three people you're selling to, and a huge, and they account for a huge fraction of your revenue, you don't have a lot of leverage. And like, you know, there's real structural problems at all these companies. I would short, you know, sort of all of them as a basket. Right. I mean, I, I want you know Crawford. I mean, yeah. their server business at IBM. I mean, well, 
I'm sorry, IBM, <laughs> Hewlett Packard Enterprises. Servers were down, software was down, services were down. But the servers business in particular looks alarming because you always wondered who they were selling to in the first place as more and more companies turned to Amazon Web Services, turned to Microsoft Azure, turned to uh, Google Rackspace, uh, you know, uh, to provide their computing. Yeah, so be really careful with that because there was another issue in the quarter, um, which I'm sure is going to come out on the call, which was that uh, one very large service provider um, pushed an order out. And to Keith's point, um, that has a huge impact on these companies. But, you know, these guys are operating in an incredibly, they have to be incredibly efficient. And when you see a mega supplier, you know, one of these hyperscale companies push a data center build out, push a data center upgrade out, that has a huge impact. I think what you want to get underneath with HP in particular is they have the largest channel of any manufacturer of servers. And, you know, guess what? That some weakness in that, in sort of small and medium business, to your and Keith's point, going to the cloud, HP really feels that, and that erodes demand as well. Um, so that, that makes it even more important that they not have these orders push to large-scale service providers like the Microsofts and, and other hosters around, or hosters and cloud service providers around the world. The easy question or the hard question? Let's take the hard one. Okay, um, Meg Whitman, uh, this was her creation. This is her decision. This is going to be the growth company. We're going to put the old businesses of computers and PCs into the other business, HPQ. HPE is going to be where we grow. It's going to be my thing that's going to put my stamp on this enterprise computing world. Now, Warren Buffett would say, if you take a, a, a manager with a great reputation, a business with a lousy reputation, is the reputation of the business that will survive. Is this Meg Whitman's fault, or is this just the industry's fault? Yeah, I think it's probably both. Like, so I'm not sure the computing business had a lot of future either, so getting rid of that probably makes a lot of sense, but I'm not sure this business has a long-term viable future in the way that people are going to do most of their computing. So what, but what does this tell us about Meg Whitman as a leader? Um, I think she has a really significant challenge, and this is probably a role for a technologist at this point. Like, they need to jump a generation or two ahead, and that's not a business role, that's a, that's a technology bet. Yeah. Good. Thank you for taking the tough question. Not an easy one. Um, I, I, won't, I won't look for Meg's Christmas card anytime soon, but uh, I wish I'm already you off the list. <laughs> well, I wish, I mean, look, there's so many people down at Hewlett Packard who've worked so hard for so many decades, and I wish them well. I can't imagine how hard that is for them. I mean, certainly want them to do better. Uh, Crawford Del Pratt, thank you very much. Also working hard at Chief Research Officer at EVP at uh, IDC. We'll check back with you later in the show. And Keith or Boy, sticking with us here from Coastal Ventures. All right, well, coming up, uh, Cisco Chairman John Chambers betting his own money on a company fighting voice fraud, a multi-billion dollar problem in the U.S. That's happening. Also, reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streamed on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 o'clock on the East Coast, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. Let's look at the call center business. It's massive. Billions of phone calls, trillions of dollars moving around in stock trades, bank transfers, product purchases, you name it. But it's also one of the fastest growing forms of cybercrime. Hackers glean information from the data hacks, like the Target hack and others we've heard about. Then they take that information, call the call centers with fake purloined info, and get your money. Pindrop is fighting phone fraud, has a big investor behind it. We talked to Cisco Chairman John Chambers and Pindrop's CEO, Vijay Balasabramanian, Check this out. So that entire business where they're asking you questions to identify yourself is a really, really bad idea. One, because it frustrates you. It doesn't catch very much fraud. Right now in the US alone, they're losing $10 billion to voice fraud, and even more so. 10 billion a year? Yeah, 10 billion a year. Because every single call that gets through, and right now, when we started the company, one in every 2,000 calls coming into these call centers was fraudulent. Now it's dropped down to one in every 900. So there's so many calls coming into these call centers because what people have realized is as people have secured their online and physical side, it's the easiest thing to pick up a phone, get a call center agent, and get him to do your bidding. And these call center agents are all about customer service, and so they're not catching the fraudsters, it's not their job. And what's happening is all these questions are translating to, in addition, $12.8 billion asking people stupid questions. John Chambers, how big is this business? This business to me is first very big in terms of the opportunity. You think about 22 
uh, billion dollars being spent either in fraud or fraud prevention and it upsets customers. You think, uh, Corey, what the real takeaway is, it's going to become a digital world, 500 billion devices connected. What was a surprise to me is voice isn't the past, voice is the future. It's the platform for the future. This is the company that, in my opinion, is going to lead both in security and authentication. So it isn't just how do you prevent the fraud. They detect 80% of the fraud calls with less than 1% uh, false positives. Almost every major security breach that you read about, 61% of them started with a voice call into the company. To some degree, I would imagine your job is creating jobs uh, at, at Pindrop, yep. but taking jobs away from the call center. Uh, no. Is that fair? What our technology does is it actually empowers call center agents to do their job better because right now what they're doing is they're treating everyone who comes to them like a criminal. So now what they can do is for 99% of the calls, they can treat you with a wonderful customer experience and then for the one percent that's not good they can treat those fraudsters what happens then you if you have a wonderful customer experience you're going to go call back the organization with your echo with your smartphone with your standard phone and when you're making all of those calls because you make those calls when you're really in need of something by giving people a great customer experience you're going to get them to come back to you over and over again which means more jobs to the call center agent now, i do want to ask you about it. how many sure. times have you been to the white house in your life uh probably 30 to 40. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and so you know how that place works better than I think just about any other CEO and certainly mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. And I wonder what you make of what's happening right now in the White House and the Trump administration and their approach to business. Gotcha. Let me um, first say that when you set a goal of 4% GDP growth per year, it's very obtainable. And you set a goal of 25 million to 30 million jobs in the next decade, also obtainable. Oddly enough, the role models are India and France. India, Modi is digitizing his entire country and he's focused on 1.1 million jobs a month. Uh, he's growing at 7% GDP and he thinks he can grow at 8 to 10%. That means the per capita income doubles every six years. Right. France, the last place in the world you start a business. We focused on it at Cisco two and a half years ago. They aligned and digitized in their country. Guess what was the top venture capital investment location in all of Europe last year? It was France. So startups are where the jobs will be created. The large companies are going to shed jobs, Corey, unfortunately, in total around the world. So all of our job growth will be from the startups. And instead of doing 90 on the NASDAQ this last year and 35 on the New York Stock Exchange, we need to do three to five times that to get the job growth we need. That's why VJ and companies like VJ are creating the jobs and why, candidly, I fell in love with the company. It, it's going to be a job creator for the future and a great investor uh, when it goes public, in my opinion. So maybe when we think about creating jobs in America, we shouldn't be talking so much about carry and Ford and 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 uh, United Technologies which carrier is part of, but maybe, maybe looking forward to uh, seeding startups in bigger ways. Well, I think it's important to retain the jobs we've got, and I think the administration is right in that and doing a good job on it. But in terms of creating 25 million new jobs, it's going to be all startups. I'm talking to the uh, YPO group, Young President's Operation, once a year uh, in, in their meeting in Vancouver, and it will be all about their job growth. So when you look at startups, when you're growing at 100%, number of people per year. That's really what we have to do at a much larger magnitude than we're currently thinking. It's very doable. You set an audacious goal, which by the way Cisco's always done, right. and then you think about how to make it happen. What's fun for me is being an advisor to VJ and really watching a, a growth industry where they should leave their industry in terms of being the top security player, the top authentication player, anytime you have a question on voice, but also their ability to go through the transitions. Now you're talking about voice going digital and what this company is positioning themselves to do in terms of security and authentication is really exciting. Well, let me ask you finally, Vijay, what's your notion of, of as your company grows, whether you want to be public or not? Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's a really, really important thing, right, to go public because it uh, affords two things, right? Like one, it affords liquidity for a lot of employees, and two, it allows you to attract really, really good talent, right? If I'm going to offer you some stock in Pindrop, how much is it valued? You're going to take my word or you're going to take the public market's word, right? So it, it's, it's definitely a great event. The thing is that we just need to make it easier for companies to go public, right? Right now, there is a stigma associated with going public. You want to grow the way you want to grow, right? And so that's one of the things that we just need to make it easier to go public. Last year, only 90 companies went public. 
That's not what you want. You want more companies going public, more people being able to invest in other startups and seeing liquidity for their investments. Vijay Balasubramanian is the Pindrop CEO and, of course, John Chambers, the executive chairman of Cisco. Well, Bitcoin's rising to an all-time high, hitting an intraday record today. The cryptocurrency up, get this, 178% over the last year. And as you can see from that chart over four years, up about 3,700%. Uh, could be some investors hedging bets against a potential global uncertainty related to uh, President Trump's new policies, or maybe speculation that Trump's administration could relax regulations governing the digital currency. But coming up, how close to the edge do we want to go? That's a line only Tesla's uh, CEO, Elon Musk, would say on an earnings call. We're going to focus on him personally leading this company next. This is Bloomberg. Hey, Time Warner is clearing its way to buy uh, AT&T, really into the sorry, for its acquisition by AT&T. The cable behemoth is going to sell its only TV station. It's kind of interesting, WPCH in Atlanta. It's being purchased by Meredith Corp. $70 million is the price tag. It's according to filing with the uh, FCC. Of course, the station is Time Warner's only FCC-regulated broadcast station. was an important part of that merger because it was the only way the FCC could regulate that deal. One stock we're watching, Tesla shares sliding Thursday uh, after investors digested the earnings report, which showed the company's uh, cash burn at a tremendous rate. It's going to continue for the first half of the year. Also, the CFO, just 15 months on the job, is quitting. Yet, Tesla, the shares are trading close to their all-time high despite the sell-off today. Uh, some big believers in Elon Musk, Keith Roy, considered part of the so-called PayPal mafia, which seems like, you know, it's not a real mafia. There's no whacking going involved, I hope. Not, not that I know about. Tell me about, tell me about Elon. What do you want to know? How, how long did you work with him? Um, well, he had already um, been displaced as CEO when I joined the company, but he was on the board of directors. So PayPal purchased X, which was his online banking company. He briefly becomes the CEO of PayPal and then and then departs, uh, but not ingloriously, I guess, if he stays on the board. Yeah, no, he stayed on the board and obviously was the, I believe, was the largest shareholder at IPO. So obviously it's a very successful investment. Um, yeah, we merged with X in March of 2000. The market collapsed a couple days later, really collapsed in June 2000, as you remember. And yeah. he uh, took over as CEO in June, stayed through the end of August. And then Peter Thiel came in as CEO, interim CEO actually originally, September 25th in 2000, and really uh, fixed the company. What, uh, what was Elon really good at? There. Well, obviously, systems engineering is the you know key skill. Um, I think that Elon shares with someone like Steve Jobs from afar and Jack Dorsey is being able to understand the business equation that lines up success in a complicated area. And very few people can actually do that. There's basically a variable like x times y times z that yields success in a business. And understanding all the moving pieces in your head and being able to tweak the right variables in the right order is a key to building a complicated company. Um, I, because critics, uh, there are so few critics of. Tesla, I've taken the role of being one, and, and, and I enjoy it because it's, 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 it's a fascinating company with a really cool product and horrible financials, and so that's <laughs> right up my, my uh, bailiwick. But I wonder how you look at that business. Well, I look at the business, and the future of auto is probably based upon software and batteries. And Tesla's is well positioned in software, at least compared to all the other people in the world that make automobiles and probably as well positioned and better positioned in batteries. So the two fundamental drivers of the future, plus design, uh, Tesla is better than anybody else on the planet at. So I think that you can- well, All right, all right. The batteries are Panasonic's invention as much as they're Tesla's, right? And it's a commoditized product. I don't know if that's a great business to I be I don't in. think it'll be a commoditized product over the long term. I think there's a lot of innovation going on in batteries under the hood, both at Tesla and other places that will propel the industry forward. And I think Tesla is well situated to capture the innovation in batteries. Basically, batteries are pushing the envelope in theoretical physics and theoretical chemistry. Right. And so innovation there is extremely difficult. We invest at Coastal Ventures in battery companies and have a set in our portfolio because we believe they're so important to the future of transportation as well as the future of mobile phones. And I think Tesla understands that and will capture most of the innovation. It is a place where there are a lot of investor bodies buried. I remember when I was working at a fund where we were shorting stocks, and I one day decided, I'm just going to short 
any company with a, with the word battery in the description, and we were already short all of them. There were no more out there, <laughs> there no more. and they all collapsed. Well, I think that was before um, innovation in the mobile devices. So the reason why these devices are so large and it's difficult right. to you know sort of make them thinner if you is take the heat dispersion yeah. with battery. And so as batteries become more capable, the smaller with longer lifespan, they allow better consumer electronics as well as better automotive uh, innovation. And and so going forward here, so you you sounds like you're optimistic about the company, even though I mean. Elon, they've got about $3 billion in cash left. They burned through a billion this quarter, and they announced they're going to accelerate CapEx to the point of two and a quarter billion before, the, before July. Look, this is not That's a not enough This money. is not a business for most CEOs. We'll start there. It's very complicated, you know, sort of making this whole thing work. That said, I think on the vectors of competition over the next decade, they're well positioned. Now, I'm not taking a position on the valuation of Tesla. Right. It is richly valued on any multiple basis. So you can make an argument that you believe that Tesla's going to be the future, but the valuation's still off. I think that's a very reasonable place. Yeah, and, and, and that's the same kind of logic people look at the Snapchat IPO too, right? Snapchat might be a great... Uh, important business, but or Twitter is one that comes up. Twitter has more influence in the world, I believe, than Facebook, but it may still be overvalued as a business qua right. business. Keith Raboy is going to stick with us for a, bit, a little bit from Coastal Ventures. Thanks for being here. I appreciate sure. it. I enjoy these conversations. With you. That's good stuff. All right, we're coming up, Square shares surging to a record high. We're going to sit down with the CFO Sarah Fryer. That is next, and a feature I'd like to bring to your attention: hit TV Go on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can see that. You can see the interview we just did. You can see all the interviews we do, whether they're live or they're old, and you can also get involved in the conversation. Send me an instant Bloomberg message. It will pop up on my screen. It'll interrupt me while I'm on TV. You can't distract me. Try it. I be me. And check us out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Mexico's foreign minister says one of the main concerns his government has is that the human rights of Mexicans living in the U.S. are respected. Luis Vidigari spoke during a press conference with his U.S. counterpart, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. Austrian Chancellor Christian Kern says Britain should be charged about $63 billion when it leaves the EU. He is the first EU leader to put a value on the size of the UK's Brexit bill. He spoke with Bloomberg Television today, saying there's a debate looming about the size of the payment. More than 1,000 migrants have been rescued in the Mediterranean Sea in just two days. The AP says more are expected to attempt the journey before the end of winter. Officials say more than 13,000 people arrived by sea since January. At least 272 reportedly died this year trying to make that crossing. Net migration to the UK hit a two-year low in the year that ended in September. Prime Minister Theresa May promised tighter controls on immigration as she prepares to start Brexit negotiations. And French presidential candidate Marine Le Pen says she's just like the British Prime Minister. Le Pen says Theresa May is running the UK with policies that she would implement as president. Surveys have her surviving the first round but losing in the election runoff phase. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Thursday here in New York, already 6.30 Friday morning in Singapore, getting ready for the weekend. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Haas Linda. I'm in with a look at the markets. Haas Linda, good morning and happy weekend. Alisa, TGIF. Now, New Zealand kicks it off. Pretty late loss to start to the day. About flat at the moment. Among movers, Sky Network, also Vector. It is an energy infrastructure company. First half profit up 7% on sales and growth. Plus, it had a one-time gain. The outlook, it says, remains on target. And New Zealand, though, on the opposite direction, putting a lid on gains on the benchmark and elsewhere in Asia. Looking ahead, the Nikkei and Aussie futures pointing to a lower open. Some investors say gains in Asia may pause. Signals suggest gains may be excessive, too far, too fast. The focus now is on company earnings. Some things to watch. The RBA's testimony to lawmakers. Philip Lowe appears before Parliament's Standing Committee on economics. And that is it. I'm Haslinda Amin. Limit Technology is next.
Consumer Technology, I'm Corey Johnson, our top story this hour, Hewlett Packard Enterprise out with results for their fiscal first quarter. Shares still down at after hours trading. Earnings call underway. The company taking a 10.5% fall in revenue. Sluggish demand for, I don't know, servers, storage, software, services. Crawford Del Pret, thank God. Uh, Crawford Del Pret, IDC. Um, uh, get, tell me something happy about Hewlett Packard. Yeah, so there are some bright spots. I mean, when you get under the covers, you know, they made an acquisition a number of years ago, uh, three par. That's up very, very strong, uh, strong double digits. Uh, com uh, and again, you know, there was a conversation we had earlier about, you know, the questioning the relevance of HP. I believe the HP will be relevant long term. It's just that the way people think about infrastructure is going to change. They bought Aruba. Because turns out when you have two or three devices per person coming into an enterprise, you have to upgrade your Wi-Fi, and you have to do that all around the world. Guess what? Aruba is showing nice, uh, you know, over 20% growth. But the problem is that they have these legacy products as well um, that, in some cases, they're divesting, and in some cases, are just older products that were that that are now being retired. And they're not moving into these new areas. That those new areas aren't contributing enough. The other area I would say that you want to look at with HP is technology services. That's one of their highest margin growth areas. It grew four percent in the quarter, and it's a renewable revenue stream over time. Um, and and I think it's an area that can contribute to margins going forward. Yeah, man, and, and you know. Kind of like Santa Claus, you can always count on HP to give us restructuring charges going all the way back to the year 2000. So, yeah. great stuff, Crawford Del Pret, Crawford Del Pret, Chief Research Officer and EVP at IDC. Thank you very much. All right, another company we're looking at is Square. Shares surging, record high in trading today. CEO Jack Dorsey, it's a part time job for him, but unlike his other company, Twitter, Square is seeing some big gains. Electronic payments company saw sales up 21% in the fourth quarter, payment volume up 34% year over year. But how long can it grow like this? Lena Wang sat down with Square's CFO, Sarah Fryer. I think it's been great to see the company go from the first problem that we solved for sellers was how to take a payment. And that's evolved into a pretty complex managed payment solution. They slowly pulled us up into becoming a point of sale solution for them. And what I really think of as a commerce platform. And then you're right, we started to build new products on top that really play to our unique advantages. So a product like Square Capital plays to the fact that we have access to data that allows us to really manage risk. And so that's just one part of the cohort of products that, as you said, now comprise a quarter of our adjusted revenue. So lots more to do there. Um, I think we can continue to grow the core. I think we'll continue to move up market. Uh, we're starting to shift from offline into online through our platform. And then, of course, we can take all of that and go global. So a lot of white space in front of us and exciting to see how that will drive our growth. I think investors are pretty excited about those newer lines of business and that white space that show potentially more profitability. And we saw a huge jump in EBITDA margin from negative six last year to 16%. Yeah. How much higher can that number grow, and where would most of that increase in profitability come from? Right. So we want to be mindful of both growing the business, but also doing it in a way that continues to expand margins. And I think we've been clear that we think about a mid-single-digit margin expansion pace is good from here. And I think that's the right balance of being able to take back into the business the, the other profits that we're throwing off and invest them back in for growth. Um, in terms of where that margin expansion will come from, from. One will just be top line up performance. So just like this quarter where we beat uh, top end of guidance by $7 million, that clearly impacts profitability. But beyond that, we want to get more efficient in our operating line expenses. I think in particular areas like G&A, um, clearly we did a big build as we went public, and now we're reaping the benefits of that. But we don't need to keep building at that same pace. Jack talked a lot on the call yesterday about automation. Automation is important for our sellers, and we want to put that into the products that they use. But it's very important internally, too, to utilize automation to make ourselves more efficient. You know, examples would be using um, machine learning in risk um, or using machine learning or AI in areas like support and sales. Um, so lots of opportunity there, and I think that will continue to help grow the margin profile. You mentioned global expansion earlier as a key point. Uh, you're currently in Japan, Australia, U.S. and Canada, but it's still largely domestic business. The vast majority of revenue comes from the U.S. So what can we expect the pace of global expansion to look like? So I think 
For us, there has been just huge opportunity here in the U.S. When you're a, a business that goes after commerce, following GDP is clearly a good route to take. Um, that said, I think a huge stride forward for Square in 2016, or it actually happened right at the end of 2015, was getting our hardware platform to a point where we could uh, globally accept payments. And what I mean by that is being able to take both chip and contactless transactions. The U.S. has been the, effectively the slow, the, the, the slow country in making that transition. Um, so we didn't have to have it here in order to be able to take electronic payments. But now that we've shifted over to a world of chip and hence EMV, and I think more importantly, getting the US into using contactless, we've now created hardware that really unlocks the rest of the world. Uh, and my hope is that will help us move faster now. And as you're evaluating M&A opportunities for international expansion, how much of that is going into your considerations for accelerating expansion? From an M&A perspective? Um, yeah, we've historically not been a company that's done a lot of M&A. Um, I think when we have done it, it's usually been to drive a product kind of beyond where the current roadmap is. Caviar is a great example uh, where we said we have a roadmap for how to provide a commerce platform for restaurants, but we're going to leap ahead and also do delivery because delivery will bring more sales. I think other times we've done M&A, it's been more about adding talent into the mix, um, very kind of typical what Silicon Valley companies will do to get great engineers, great data scientists. So I think it'll be more of the same for us. Um, I don't want to say that we would not use M&A to do something really big. We're always looking, and if something serendipitously came our way that really accelerated the business, we'd absolutely do it. Um, just right now, don't see something of that scale on the horizon. And Square was one of the many tech companies earlier this month to sign a legal document condemning President Trump's executive order. Uh, how do you foresee developing legislation in this area, potentially impacting your sellers, which are very diverse? Sure. So the amicus brief around immigration uh, was important for us to sign. Um, we feel strongly that immigrants have brought a lot to this country, um, and in particular to our sellers, right? These are the people who found businesses, who work at the businesses. Uh, um, and our you know, small businesses are the lifeblood of an economy. Um, they have shown tremendous growth here in the U.S. as an example. So we want to make sure we stand for inclusion, um, and that's true of our company, so for the, the employees of Square, but also true for to stand in front of our sellers as well and help be an aggregated voice for them. Um, there's something amazing when you have millions of sellers on your platform, um, but you can kind of act as a powerful voice for what they care for and, and really be heard at our scale, and I think that was why it was important for us to take a stand there. That was the CFO of Square. Her name is Sarah Fryer, just like the great, great Bloomberg reporter, also named Sarah Fryer. Hey, uh, breaking news, I want to give you on the self-driving car front. Uh, Google's working on a self-driving car. They called it business Waymo. Uber's working on a self-driving car. Waymo is suing Google for patent infringement. We're going to get more on that story as some headlines cross, get you some more details. But I want to go back to Square. Talk about their earnings report and talk about the business. Uh, Selena Wang, of course, who did that great interview, is with us right now, as is Keith Raboy, who used to work there. You had to feel like a proud father when you watch Sarah Fryer. She's impressive uh, as CFO. You brought her into that company. Um, what was really interesting to me about the, the quarter that, that uh, Square reported is that a quarter of the revenues were from new things the company has created in the last two years. And it was a really strong quarter in a revenue front. Um, the, this is a company that seems to know how to make stuff. Yeah, well, I think like it's almost a hundred million dollar standalone business now, which right. is pretty impressive. That's arguably like a two billion dollar company just on the new businesses. And then there's the platform. And a snap valuation, sure. But well, a snap valuation should be worth <laughs> twenty billion at right. least. Uh, um, you know, Square's a much better business. But uh, fundamentally, <laughs> agreed. At the, uh, great. All right, you want to buy some shares? Um, but in any event, the uh, Square's fundamental business attracts SMBs at scale. The largest SMB collection in the world is small, medium-sized small, businesses. Small, medium-sized right. businesses come to Square and use. Square Square to run their business. The largest example of that is Intuit, which is a $30 billion company. Square's you know, catching up to Intuit in terms of size of its relationship with paying SMB customers. And eventually, I think people will see that Square can be the same platform that Intuit is. You know, Intuit hasn't innovated in a decade, but still worth $30 billion. Well, and, and those transactions create revenue for Square every time. Every time someone goes to QuickBooks, they're not generating revenue for Intuit. No, exactly.
exactly. It's a better, it's a kind of an auto scaling business model, which is really neat because there's not that many of those. I think it's pretty interesting though. You said they're able to get bigger and bigger businesses and we've seen very steady growth in those larger businesses, but we saw the Starbucks relationship did not really work out. Do you think that they're ever going to be able to attract a business at that scale again while maintaining their transaction revenues? Well, the Starbucks is a very large business. I mean, it's like the fifth or sixth largest merchant in the planet kind of thing. So I think there's a big difference between going from an individual coffee shop to Starbucks, and there's a lot of room to grow in between those. But businesses of that scale can do a lot of things for themselves that most people don't want. Most people don't want to build their own IT group, their own security group, security engineering group, their you know risk group, et cetera. As you get to a large enough business, you can justify some of those costs yourself and having headcount against them. Square should be like the automatic, just work like a microwave oven. You press a button and everything just works in your business. You get all the reports, information, data, analytics, marketing, customer acquisition, everything. There's a lot of demand for that, but that's not for everybody. Walmart's not going to run on Square most likely in the short term. Yeah, it seems like those are the, that question might dog Square forever. When are you going to get Target? When are you going to get another Starbucks? When are you going to get another Walmart? And Maybe that's not the game. Well, I don't think that's a, you know, a good way to look at mar most markets either. I think like sometimes people get overly attracted to big brands and providing enterprise services to big brands is usually not the best market. We talked right. about in terms of HP. They're selling to three very large companies and that's actually gonna undermine HP's market cap. Right. Fundamentally, selling to all the other businesses in the world can, fun can be a much better business model. Long tail. Yeah, absolutely. The long tail is really valuable. But also, so. they have only penetrated you know, a few million business, small businesses in the U.S. They have much more runway to go in addition to Western Europe, which is yep. also going to be a very successful market. And the, and the, and the gross margin issue doesn't dog them like it seemed like it might during the IPO. Selena Wang, thank you very much. Keith Raboy sticking with us. We appreciate that very much. All right, coming up, how Trump's visa changes could impact the $300 billion U.S. biotech industry. This is Bloomberg. Well, the companies that power the more than $300 billion biotech industry in the U.S. are increasingly alarmed by President Trump's plans to restrict immigration. Bloomberg News reporter Donnie Bloomfield reports on the nation's biotech hub of, of Cambridge, Mass. To crank out discoveries, U.S. biotech companies rely on the world's best scientists and researchers. There's confusion right now and there's uncertainty, and confusion and uncertainty are never good. Johannes Frioff is the co-founder at Lab Central, a biotech incubator in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I came here from Germany. I'm a green card holder. We found that about 73% of the companies here at Lab Central were founded or co-founded by immigrants. The 28,000 square foot facility with shared lab space was designed as a launch pad for startups. They work on new technologies in life sciences. Those could be new drugs to cure diseases, or they could be medical devices, or they could be tools for use in the laboratory. Technology Freehoff fears is threatened by the Trump administration's controversial immigration policies. No hate, no fear. Including possible changes to visa programs. I will direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuses of visa programs that undercut the American worker. The H-1B program allows tens of thousands of employees from abroad each year to work in specialty positions in the U.S. More than 20,000 visas were granted in the medicine, health, and life science occupations in 2014, and is often one of the main routes through which employers sponsor staff from outside the U.S. Staff like Scheidt Sebastian, who is developing vaccines at a company based out of Lab Central. There is a significant population of immigrants who are in the biotech industry and the biotech field. And having all these additional stumbling blocks would really take them back and really put a stop to some of these key important uh, talents that uh, we need to bring here that would accelerate some of these life-saving medicines. For many, it's personal. Shazi Amir is an employee at Lab Central, a British citizen, and the daughter of a Pakistani immigrant. Um, on a personal level, we have four children. We do worry about them and worry about their future within the U.S. With all that's happening, at the minute, it's just an immigration ban, but where does it end? You know, where is it going to go? How far is this going to go? U.S. bioscience firms employ 1.7 million people, 
according to an industry back study, including a rising number of foreigners. A draft executive order seen by Bloomberg reads, our visa programs should be administered in a manner that prioritizes the protection of American workers. I think it's really a sign that you're going elsewhere to try and recruit somebody because you cannot find someone to fill this job in, at your company with a pool that's easily and readily available in this country. I don't think it's a, it's a, a real risk that this tool be used to undercut uh, wages in this country at all. Chief executives of global drug companies with U.S. operations criticize further restrictions. AstraZeneca CEO told Bloomberg, science doesn't have borders, so anything that gets in the way of a borderless science exchange doesn't help. This has been a big driver for our success in the past, and it's important that we maintain that. Our Bloomberg News reporter, Donnie Bromfield, uh, Bloomfield, I said, in Cambridge, Mass. Coming up, Alphabet self-driving car business Waymo suing Uber, as I just told you those headlines crossing right now. We're going to dig into that story next. This is Bloomberg. All right, a breaking story. I told you we're going to dig into this. Alphabet self-driving car unit's called Waymo, and now it's suing Uber for stealing trade secrets related to their self-driving cars. We just learned about the lawsuit, uh, but we've got help right now. The, it's happening in U.S. District Court here in San Francisco. Bloomberg News uh, legal reporter Carter Hay Mahotra joins us right now, as well as Keith Raboy still with us from Coastal Ventures. Uh, tell me what this is about. So uh, You've got the suit. I do. It's right here. It's glorious. Um, so Waymo claims that Uber um, has taken their technology for self-driving cars, um, and that's led to about half a billion dollars in, in profits. Um, in revenue, sorry. Uh, they claim that a former executive from Waymo stole about 14,000 confidential files from their server and took it over to Uber, where they are building a similar program. We've heard these stories before, Keith. I, I can't think of how many companies. I mean, heck, uh, uh, Fitbit, right? That sounds like the Fitbit uh, uh, Jawbone lawsuit, where an employee moves over, uh, Jawbone claims, or sorry, Fitbit claims, hey, they backed their stuff up to the server. We didn't know they even had it. We turned it over right away. But these suits can sometimes be really serious. Well, I think these suits are very different than patent infringement. I think there's an ethos against patent infringement in Silicon Valley. So I would have been shocked if Google had sued or Al Alphabet had sued Uber directly for violating some IP. But theft, I think, is something that is culturally you know, acceptable to police and prosecute. And so I think that's you know, unacceptable in a line that Alphabet's going to enforce. What do you mean ethos against patent infringement? Like if Google's employees would have gone ballistic if Google had sued Uber directly. I think it's just unacceptable to use patents offensively in most Silicon Valley software companies. Like just like you saw this like outpouring of you know sort of moral outrage on the immigration order. There's that kind of outrage against using patents offensively in Silicon Valley. That's interesting. Um, uh, but and yet patents are there for defense. So, so talk to me this kind of suit. We, like, as I mentioned, we've seen a lot of these suits like this. We have. Uh, we've seen, as you mentioned, the the um, Fitbit Jawbone, jawbone yeah. Fitbit. Uh, but this is this is sort of the first suit we've seen come out of. Google, where they're really taking the offensive, as you've said. Um, how this shakes out is, is going to be a huge question. Um, there's a lot of tech at stake. There's a lot of money at stake. And, and, and we see so many companies working on, on, a, on a limited pool of talent resources where, you know, for just in Silicon Valley, right? Ford and Delphi, two companies you don't think of as Silicon yep. Valley, but they, are, they have hired hundreds of people in Silicon Valley. Of course, you've got Google, you've got Tesla, you've got Apple, you've got uh, um, uh, 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 Uber all right here, all trying to go after people who know how to make self-driving cars. Well, I think there's a difference between what you might have in your brain, which is really hard to police and enforce, versus actually taking copies of documents. I think there's a pretty bright line there, and I think those who violate that line should be fired, and it's perfectly proper to you know, pursue their employer for using any of that information. There's a question of knowledge. Sometimes the company doesn't really know that the employee has taken this information and started to use it in their new job. Um, that would obviously be a problem if, if Uber had awareness of that. But, but what it, you're saying is Uber, should, if, if Uber knew of an employee that they'd hired from Google came with documents, Uber should hire fire that person. Absolutely. I, I know of many companies that have done that, where they found an employee took information from a prior job. If they found out about that, especially if the employee 
deceives the company about it and tries to hide it, absolutely a firing offense. Sounds like deflate gate all over again. Uh, great stuff. Uh, Carter K. Mahotra, thank you very much from our legal team here at Bloomberg News, right down the aisle. Uh, Keith Roy, thank you very much. Always good to see you. Uh, Pleasure to be here. Good to have you with Ke uh, Keith Roy from uh, Coastal Adventures. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Coming up on Friday's show, we're going to dig into the drone industry. Airmap CEO Ben Marcus is with us. Uh, some really cool stuff going on there. Check that out. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.